Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, unlike everyone else, I'm going to be, who've been, most people have been very specific, I'm going to be horribly non-specific and just try and go over a few concepts in the limited time available. One of the things that's um, really interesting about introception is the fact that it is a liminal area that intersects a number of concepts, a number of specific uh, fields, which I think is extremely interesting. And the cross-fertilization between them is obviously the way in which advances will be made. Now, I was reading a paper very recently that came out about 40 years ago in the Annals of General Psychiatry. And some of the points which uh, may come up up in this talk are um, mentioned there, and one of them is that uh, although that uh, they felt uh, Galin felt that um, neurology and psychodynamics um, were advancing rapidly at that period, the attempts to integrate them were not very uh, fruitful, um, and uh, that I think we're seeing as uh, in this particular conference is um, changing, and that's where these. Um, important developments are being made. Now, further on in that paper, he documents uh, and summarizes the changes that followed on the um, callosotomy data from Sperry's lab and human data and his own monkey experiments in which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with most of these responses. They're now sort of almost axiomatic. And the uh, idea of a right hemisphere dominance for um, nonverbal, more um, irrational, for want of a better word, emotional-based uh, gestalt um, um, determinations compared to the um, left verbal and, and uh, rational brain. But there are a couple of concepts that he mentioned which were hypothetical, which um, were interesting. And he suggested that there was a balanced inhibition between the two uh, area, between the two hemispheres uh, that regulated an appropriate behavioral responses to environmental conditions. And that which hemisphere became, was dominant was determined on the uh, reinforcement that, uh, that resulted from choosing the appropriate behavioral response to the environment. Most interestingly was that he suggested that as a result of this, there may be some lateralization of autonomic function. And this um, was something that um, remained more of a um, sort of theoretical concept, but um, probably about uh, 20, 15 years later, the concept of um, lateralization, particularly related to cardiovascular uh, function, came along. And um, the data from, uh, in this particular instance, animal experimentations in the rat and monkey, but also some experiments in the human, um, led uh, us to hypothesize that uh, there was indeed lateralization of cardiovascular function, that this wasn't sort of completely segregated, but the, to sort of, again, talk very superficially about this, the idea and the concept emerged that um, sympathetic um, cardiomotor um, and um, um, blood pressure regulatory activity probably resided predominantly in the right hemisphere, right um, insular cortex, anterior insular in the human, uh, rostral posterior insular in the animal, with, um, with uh, parasympathetic cardiomotor and baroreceptor sensitivity regulatory activity being more likely to be domiciled on the left. But that there wasn't a complete separation, and in fact there were cross-colosal pathways that were predominantly inhibitory uh, uh, that linked these two areas. So that was um, a concept that came along, and I mentioned the fact that I thought that advances in this area will probably be most predominant through cross-fertilization of multiple disciplines. Unfortunately, at the time that um, we did a lot of that work, um, I wasn't at all aware of the work that was, had been done in the behavioral area, including uh, the James Langer theory and uh, Damasio's somatic marker hypothesis, because the response to a lot of this data was, well, why, what's the point about this? The autonomic nervous system is purely there to uh, maintain physiological homeostasis and to work in a very, very, very um, um, 
sort of non, it's a very patterned response, like uh, as we've heard from about the canon um, theory of sympathetic uh, effects. Um, so the idea that there might be some sort of um, lateralization that has some function with regard to the autonomic nervous system was a concept that um, was somewhat novel. But as a result of trying to um, merge these two areas, I think the concepts of what I'd like to call homeostatic dualism may well emerge, where the autonomic nervous system should be, uh, the way we think of it, might need to be repurposed. So there are two levels, at least. There's the simple level, which is the physiological homeostatic mechanism, which we've heard uh, some, some, something about earlier on, related to blood pressure control, for example, osmolar regular uh, regulation and so on and so forth but and, and to and maintain these the milieu interior uh, around set points that are determined by the system but there's also an emotional homeostasis which is much more complex which is determined by these autonomic inputs the aim of which is to maintain the individual at the minimum amount of stress uh, in order to cope with the environmental cue and but when these are out of whack, as it were, when they actually are in conflict, then you have homeostatic dualism, which is a little play on the words. And where that has some really important consequences is in the cardiac um, realm. And it's uh, of interest to both cardiologists as well as to cardiac electrophysiologists. Primarily, when uh, a, a serious stress occurs, and um, whether this is internally uh, generated or whether it's in response to, for example, what I'm doing now, which is talking to an audience, um, there will be a dysregulation of cardiac sympathovagal balance, which works at many levels, including changing the cardiac channel structure within the heart, which if it works outside normal, for want of a better word, realms, can result in a variety of uh, malignant conditions, some of which I'm going to show you now. One of them is this, which uh, is a 2D um, echocardiogram of a heart of a patient who was admitted under uh, conditions of severe sudden onset of stress with a normal uh, coronary artery vasculature. This is actually what the heart should look like at the end diastolic phase, where the blood is actually being expelled from these vent from the predominantly the left ventricle. Under conditions of stress with disordered sympathovagal balance, what one sees is that the base of the heart here doesn't contract and you're left with this very low ejection fraction which compromises seriously compromises cardiac function it's accompanied by chest, by anginal chest pain but not on a vascular nature and some very severe um, arrhythmias may occur including this which is called torsade de pointe and it can lead to sudden cardiac death so the stress perception in the individual, when it's dysregulated and above uh, an appropriate set point, may result in some very serious um, changes, both which can be observed at the macro level at the heart, but also at the micro level. This is a change which has been characterized by the term of uh, myocytolysis, where there is a focal disruption of uh, myocardial cells and um, monocyte infiltration, as well as subendocardial hemorrhaging, um, which occurs um, completely distinct from uh, blood vessels, but is dominated, uh, pre predominantly centered on sympathetic terminals within the heart itself. So lateralization uh, um, of cardiovascular function and of autonomic function may play a particularly important role in the determination of behavioral uh, responses to complex environments. And as a result, that's if one believes in the uh, Damasio somatic marker concept and the uh, James Langer hypothesis. And as a result of that, the autonomic nervous system contribution requires to be represented in a much more uh, exquisite pattern within the brain itself at the highest cortical level so that the appropriate um, processing of incoming information can be made and the appropriate selection of behavior in a social, socially behaving animal um, so that the appropriate patterns can be, um, can be chosen. <clears throat> 
and these have their particular autonomic markers. One very important aspect of it is, in fact, um, the uh, cardiac uh, signal, the cardiovascular signal, which includes um, the blood pressure response within the brain itself. So um, there are several um, issues that need to be considered with all of this. And as I said, I'm talking very, very superficially, so we can go into more detail if there are any questions that relate to this at the end of the session. But um, one of the interesting points that emerges from the discussion that for, that preceded this is we've, we've talked about how there may be an, an autonomic imprint that's determined by the uh, cardiovascular system, particularly the heart rate. The heart rate is very, or the heartbeat is very important. It's two components. One is a temporal stamp, in other words, the actual RR interval, and the other is the accompanying inotropic effect, which can stimulate mechanoreceptors. So it's split into two very important components analyzed separately and also compared. Now, if that's the case, and if that has an important impact on in determining behavior and behavioral choice uh, through the somatic imprint of a perception, then what happens to patients who have a cardiac arrhythmia how does that affect their ability to perceive their environment? And I'm not clear that there's a lot of data, if any, on that. There's a lot of data on the response to heart of the way in which manipulation of heartbeat can influence um, behavioral characteristics, but I'm not sure about the abnormal situation, and that is one that's of great interest, I think. So the final slide is actually one where, which reminds me of the caveats. A lot of this, we, we talked at the beginning about how um, cross-fertilization from different disciplines is very helpful in terms of gaining new insights and producing further developments within uh, the field of interoception in all probability. But we have to be very careful in, pr in, 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 in making those, uh, in making assumptions because we're trying to, in my case, for example, um, having to deal with uh, anesthetized, paralyzed, ventilated rats and try to make an extrapolation from that as to what's happening in an awake, behaving human being. That's just as concerning as trying to evaluate what your cat might be thinking from its uh, facial characteristics. So thank you very much indeed.